What do all these successful people have in common? You know, whether it was the mattress dealer, the car dealer, the furniture dealer, or Elon Musk, they spend money, man. You know, they spend money, they spend a lot of money. And they don't worry about money the way I was worried about it. They use money. They didn't save it, they didn't hoard money. Mm -hmm. What are you doing? You're making Gucci rich, you're making Louis Vuitton rich, you're making all these companies rich, but you're keeping yourself broke. If you are one of those people who believe that hard work and honesty alone will bring riches, carry so thought because it's not true. No amount of reading or memorizing makes us successful. It's the understanding and application of wise thoughts that count. What I have learned in 14 years, and I've learned it a good 10 years ago, I'd say, is I never choose a business, I always choose the entrepreneur. Entrepreneurs have one thing in common. They keep going. They'll change the rules. They'll reinvent the rules. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't just take one answer. Follow your passion, follow your passion. I think it should be follow your purpose. You see, an idea is a thought or a collection of thoughts directed towards a purpose. Most people would never do what they're doing if they're thinking. The thinking is not something everybody gets involved in. If you understand money, you become financially educated, you're willing to talk about it. Well, now you can be financially stable doing whatever you want and you can follow something you love and still be financially okay because we assume that you have to have this in order to make money. You have to have this job in order to make good money. You have to have this career if you want to be financially stable, but that's a complete lie. I want you to get balance. I want you to have enough investing, which is the same as savings, but comes in tiers. Tier one, tier two, tier two, three on risk. And the first tier is if everything goes wrong, I'm okay. Then your next level is, okay, what am I gonna get the highest returns? What is my best bet? And then, two, that it's, it's not just the investment, it's where am I? Am I in the middle of a fight? Like, I don't wanna be in the middle of a fight. Okay, what's it going to be like? And then third, are they in the risk of an international war? So this is a time for looking for such things. I always say the first thing is, and I say this and I, I want people to understand this, invest in what you understand. Mm -hmm. So if Not you wear so, Nikes. Yeah, you should be looking at apparel brands, mm -hmm. right? Nike, Lululemon, because you understand that, right? If you a workout person, then you should be looking at like Planet Fitness, things like that. Like if you are a tech person, if you use an Apple phone, you should 100% be on looking at Apple, right? If you're a car person, like, but one of the things I like now is FinTech, mm -hmm. financial technology. So everybody uses PayPal or Square. Right, that is the way money is changing. Mm -hmm. The way we use money is completely different now. So I think everybody should be investing in fintech right now, 100%. But I look at it as, so every investor has what's called an investor identity. Like, what you're willing to risk, your risk tolerance. What companies you're more familiar with. If you're a doctor, then you know more about medicine. So you should be in biotech, or pharmaceuticals, healthcare. You should, that should be your thing. If you are, again, a person who is in software, mm -hmm. then cybersecurity, software, that's where you're going to be strong at. And that's where your strong points are. I remember Warren Buffett said for a long time, he didn't understand technology. So he didn't buy technology. He didn't buy Apple stock until like 2017. Mm -hmm. He's like, I don't understand. I don't even have a computer. I don't use it. Yeah. I don't even use it. Right? So I learned that from him. He says, I put things in a too hard box. Right, yeah. so the, 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 the easiest thing is like wherever you work at, like look around. Mm -hmm. Wherever you shop at, look around. Mm -hmm. Every time I buy a product, I'm looking at who made it. So I can go look that up, see if it's a public company, if it's mm -hmm. a private company, right? If it's public, I mean, we can all invest into it. If I can invest into it, I want a piece of it. You know what I'm saying? Just to keep it simple. We don't That's even right. have to make it hard, right? right? You don't have to be Warren Buffett out the gate. Like you don't have to be that. Like Warren Buffett didn't become Warren Buffett until 20 years, 30 years in. So you gotta <laughs> figure out who you are as a person, who you are right. as an investor, 
that take you to that next level. Money is one part of our lives. And we, the reason why people are scared to talk about it is because we're insecure about it. And that's because we don't understand how money plays a part in our lives. It's one aspect. I say that there's four. You have to be physically healthy, mentally healthy, spiritually healthy, and then financially healthy. Mm -hmm. If you're not financially healthy, well, it can make everything else much more miserable because you can't pay your bills. But if you're financially healthy, you're rich, but you have nothing else, more money just makes you more miserable. Mm -hmm. So you need to live a holistic life and understand how money plays a part in your life. That way the, the finances can have the biggest power. And then you understand that more money just amplifies who you are. It's like fire, it's like fuel. It fuels your fire. If you're a good person and you have more money, you have a tool to do more good. If you're a bad person, you have more money, you have a tool to do more bad. So financial independence is saying, I now can make money for myself. I don't got to worry about my job. I don't got to worry about none of that. I can create the cash flow that comes to my own. Financial freedom says money is no longer even an issue. Big difference. Mm -hmm. Because even someone who can create money for themselves still doesn't have freedom all the time. Right. You can be an entrepreneur and be a slave to the business. You build yourself a job. You build yourself a yeah. job. Yeah. Right. But financial freedom says your money is not even an issue no more. Right. And, it, and that don't even have to be a lot. Make your life better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and you don't want to be now just, just buying a whole bunch of Gucci and Louis Vuitton. It's now actually improving your life. So the simplest example would be you start a YouTube channel. We talked about buying a camera. Well, one thing that you could do is you can hire a video editor. You know, you go on a freelance site, hire a freelance video editor, and uh, now what are you doing? You can spend more time making more videos mm -hmm. instead of spending all of your time editing the content. So you can focus on yes. your time. You, you can hire someone to mow the lawn. You bought your time back. You can hire somebody to help get you your groceries. You buy uh -huh. your time back. It costs money. You have to spend money in order right. to do that. But you're getting something in an exchange. And now you're buying your time back so you can use your money as a tool. And you can use your money as a tool to buy your time back or you can use your money as a tool to make you and attract you more money. That's what wealthy people do. And so you want to be able to use money in that way. Again, class of people are used to life dictating them. Man, what's up? How you feeling, man? man I'm making it, man. Well, you ask somebody, well, what's up, man? Just close out on a deal. <laughs> you know, got a couple business meetings. Like, I love attacking life. Mm -hmm. And it don't have to be, it don't always have to be going the way you want. As long as you attack it. Mm -hmm. Every day I get up saying, yo, I got an opportunity to go attack. Right? Every I got an opportunity to change something. To make sure, turn my last name into an asset. Right? Mm. Turn my last name into an asset. That's cool. Like, own my 24 hours. That's the goal. Like, the person who can own their 24 hours can create freedom. There's nothing wrong with spending money. There's nothing wrong with having luxuries. There's nothing wrong with having the nice things. Yes. But it's a matter of when can you actually afford it. You have mm -hmm. to know when the right time is for you to have it because you want to first make yourself rich and then, hey, yeah. blow. If you can afford it, do whatever you want. I was 26 years old. I'd been losing my entire life. And in 1961, I met a man by the name of Ray Stanford. You had to admire the guy. He was a good looking guy. He was very successful. He always had money and he was very happy. He got me to sit down and take a look at my results. He put a big R on a sheet of paper and he said, Bob, let that represent the results that you're getting in your life. Then he put two letters, three letters down beside it, two H's and a W. And he said, let that represent happiness, health and wealth. Now he said, I'm gonna ask you a question. He said, do you think I'm a happy guy? And I said, yeah, you seem pretty happy to me. He said, have you ever seen me when I was sick? And I had to admit I hadn't. He said, have you ever seen me when I was broke? Well, he said, you know, you've gotta be one of the most miserable people I've ever met. And the guy was right on the night. I was, I was an unhappy person. And he said, you're always sick. He said, you don't have a terminal illness or anything, but you've always got a headache, a cold or something. And he said, you're always broke. I was earning $4,000 a year and I owed six. I owed everybody that I knew money. He said, why don't you change? Well, you know, it never entered my mind that I could. I think I just got up and put in my day. And I think a lot of people live that way. And he said, do you ever read anything? And uh, I said, no, I can't read. Now that wasn't true, I could, but not well. And he said, you know, the secret of the ages are locked up in books. 
If you do exactly what I tell you, you can have anything you want. Well, of course, I didn't believe that. I mean, I had never had what I wanted. And so when he said that, there's no way that I could believe it. But there was one key point. I believed he believed it. And for some strange reason, I think I locked into that. He gave me a book. He gave me this book, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. All I wanted was some money. I figured if I had some money, my whole world would change. And my first goal, where he put, he said, you've got to sit down and you've got to write your goal. You've got to write it on a card and you've got to carry the card in your pocket. I've been doing that now for 55 years. I wrote on the card that I was going to have $25,000 by New Year's Day of 1970. I really didn't believe it would happen. I gave myself almost a decade to do it. And you know, the foundation of this is anything the mind can conceive and believe it can achieve. Well, I've, I've altered that a bit for the start. I think anything the mind can conceive, if you think about it often enough, you will come to believe it. So you don't have to believe it to start off with because I didn't believe it. And I'm speaking from experience here. I didn't believe I'd ever get the 25,000. I didn't even know anyone with $25,000, but I kept reading the book. Now, do you know, a strange thing happens. See, when you write something, writing causes thinking. Thinking creates an image. The image then is impregnated into cells in your brain. Our belief systems based upon our evaluation of something. And frequently, if you reevaluate a situation, your belief about that situation will change. And suddenly, I realized I'd figured it out. It had taken me nine and a half years from that day in London, trying to figure out why did I change. Nine and a half years later in the restaurant, it dawned on me. My belief system had changed because I was reevaluating who I was. But you start studying this material and I can assure you one thing, you will begin to think. And all the great leaders all down through history have been in complete and unanimous agreement on that one point, that you and I become what we think about. We are all the same. We look different, we sound different, but when you get past the culture, and culture is nothing but group habit, that's exactly what it is. When you get past the culture, we are all the same. There is one mind. There's not millions of minds, there is one. And we are an individualized expression of it. And when we tap into that universal mind, it operates by law. The idea must move into form. That's one of the first laws of the universe, the perpetual transmutation of energy. You see, studying Napoleon Hill got me to study the laws that this whole universe operates with. You understand that winter never follows winter. When the tide goes out, it always comes back in. We have to understand that whatever Rembrandt or Van Gogh used, we have available to us. We're God's highest form of creation. Spirit flows to and through us. It's our responsibility to decide what we're going to do with it. I think we've got an obligation to do great work. We're only here for a short time, not a long time. And we've got the faculties and the ability to do great work. I think we should. I'm a guy that grew up in the middle class. All I do is do drugs all day long. I don't learn a damn thing, nothing. One night there's a deal that goes down in my house, me and another buddy are partying. They call it partying, it's never a party. It's always bad. I open the door to walk this dude out and this other guy jumps up on this, uh, this step, puts a 45 caliber pistol right in my face, literally right here in my face, jam the barrel right into my head. You can see the scar right here, okay? Then he took the back of it and started hammering both sides of my head, underneath the mouth, on top of the head, put 76 stitches in my head and face. And I went to the hospital my mom was called to the hospital. My mom had no idea who I was. She's like, but where's my son? 28 days later, I was in a treatment center for drug addiction. And I finally put my first couple of days not using drugs together. But more importantly than not doing something, I started something that day. I'm going to become somebody. I want a great life. I want to be the guy that has freedom. I went into work the next day. The people that I worked for were gracious enough to let me keep that job. I took that addiction for drugs and literally threw it into my work. And I really started learning from the, the, the in the beginning. What, what you learn is you're learning from the master. 
you know, and, and so I'm, I'm duplicating and emulating. Then at some point you cross over and you become the master. If you're a guy like me, I'm always looking to improve everything. I'm looking for another little tweak, another little twist. You and I did that with the podcast. I'm looking for that, that next thing all the time, how to make something just a little better, a uh, little faster. And so at some point I kept studying this guy until I, I was able, in the beginning, I didn't challenge anything. I used, I duplicated, let me, I got Let me results. follow the script that I, that I learned. Let me use exactly what he's telling me to do, do it. I, whatever, whatever I heard, I'm gonna I'm be like, I'm gonna make that work. That's gonna be my stable datum. And once I, could re, once I could trust that, then I could build on top of it. I never yeah butted anything. Oh, I got a better way in the beginning. Dude, until I got the results, over and over, consistent results. Then I started, be, then I started teaching it to other people. Then I started learning angles. And then, then, then I basically created my own style and my own, I actually almost threw away what I had learned and created this new thing called information assisted selling. Information assisted selling. Where I started leading with what people wanted rather than this guy kind of hid. It was the old school, hide it. Don't you know, avoid the price, bring it up later. And that's where I really started accelerating everything, giving people the information up front, allowing you to understand how much this watch or ring was or car was. Before you even asked about it, I'd tell you it's 58,000. Right away, so you wouldn't wait to the very end. You'd say, Here's yeah, so everything. Look, look if, you're, if you're shopping for a car or a watch or a ring or a, a coaching program, whatever it is, you, you probably want to know how much it is. I know I would. This this particular product's fifty eight thousand. It would require about you know twenty five hundred dollars down. Your payments would be about five fifty a month. Um, let's be sure you're on the right product. You see, I've already I I got the va the value proposition, the money. I got you thinking about money right now. I want you thinking about money, so that when I show the product, you can start making sense of it. Because I can't convince you that it's worth it. You have to so you convince you. They gave me a little pill and said, you need to take this little pill every day. I said, dude, I came here to get off pills, okay? And before I left, the counselor grabbed me and said, hey, if you don't give up your ideas of getting rich, because in 28 days, you share your whole life, all your dreams, your goals, everything. They're trying to get to what happened. Give up all your ideas of writing books. Give up your ideas of, uh, of helping people all over the world. Just help the alcoholic and the drug addict, and that'll be enough. Give up any ideas of being rich and famous, being free and financially wealthy. Give it up, okay? Because if you if you need to be satisfied with one thing, not using drugs every day. So I went home with my little pill, sat down that night, looked at that little pill on the little table that I had, and and um, remember what that dude was telling me. Give up all these ideas. Looked at that pill. I'm like, dude, I'm gonna show this guy that I'm not powerless not unmanageable. I can control my life. I'm going to get rich. And so if I could just stay busy, okay, if I could just have a place to work every day and something to do and somebody to call and somebody to be in front of, that that was my big fear. My big fear was that little white pill. I threw those in the trash that night. Never would use another one again. And I just made a decision that day not to quit, not to be powerless, not to be unmanageable, but to be somebody. And I've been doing that since I was 25. Every day waking up, today I'm going to be somebody. I'm not just going to think about it. I'm going to be somebody today. I'm going to grow into who I should be. For most, the idea of losing everything you have worked so hard to achieve seems terrifying and career ending. However, in the life of an entrepreneur, this is a daily battle. Robert Kiyosaki, the man behind the famous book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, not only knows what this feels like, but has been in that exact position. You wake up tomorrow morning and you're on the street and you have nothing you don't have a single contact in your network all you have is the knowledge and experience that you've had throughout your career how do you build up from there well i've been there many times so it's no big deal you just figure out what's needed and want it and you go do it entrepreneurs have one thing in common they keep going They'll change the rules. They'll reinvent the rules. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't just take one answer. So a real entrepreneur, it really makes no difference which country you're in. Entrepreneur is a mindset first, a skill set, and rules. And depending upon whether you're an employee or a small business, mm -hmm. the rules are different. 
The mindsets are different. The skill sets are different. Robert believes that to be the entrepreneur you were meant to be, you have to understand that you must be willing to accept the lows and the highs and constantly be learning to stay ahead. So I look at life as learning. I'm constantly learning. You know, I'm reading constantly, studying constantly. I spend my, most of my time with entrepreneurs. I don't spend my time with people who complain about the economy. You know. So nothing will really change. I just go back to being an entrepreneur. Entrepreneurship can be an extremely complicated thing, but can help the average person become stronger in the financial and investing realms that are so readily available today. The question is, how can someone become financially literate? What does it take to get a positive cash flow? And most importantly, what does it take to get rich? In this video, we'll give you some of the best tips and tricks that Robert Kiyosaki has to offer to reach your financial goals. Tip one, rewire your brain. We often think that we cannot adjust or change the way our brains work, but on the contrary, with a simple change of mindset, it opens up a whole world of possibilities. I want a good pension. Does that have medical benefits? That's their brain. It's them speak. I can't help them. They got to rewire the brain, yeah. Because the economy takes place between this year and this year. That's where the economy takes place. And in your heart and in your guts. Tip two, use debt to get ahead. Now this sounds completely counterproductive. How can debt help you get ahead? As Robert puts it, you have to have the right kind of debt that works in your favor versus one that is essentially just a bill. There's good debt and bad debt. Again, it goes back to the financial statement, income, expense, asset, liability. So debt falls in here. So if you, let's say I'm gonna buy Everybody says, I'm going to buy a house. Everybody says, my house is an asset. That's not true. Your house is a liability. I don't care if you have no debt on it or not. A house is a liability. Same as if you have a car. A car is a liability. And the reason for that is, as we talked about earlier, the six words that are basics of financial education, financial intelligence, income expense, asset liability, and the two other words are cash flow. So when you look at the average person, they have a job, money comes in here, they pay for their house, and the money goes to a bank through a mortgage. So it's not an asset because the cash is flying, flowing out. So it's a liability. So the definition of liability, does it take money from your pocket? And for an asset, does it put money in your pocket? So when I have a rental property here, it puts money in my pocket. So if I live in the house, it's a liability because even if I have no debt on it, I still have taxes, depreciation, repairs, and upkeep, insurance, and all this. When I rent a property, I've done a good job buying it and structuring it. Every month, it sends me money. So I started off when I was 25. I had a little one-bedroom condo, and it put 25 bucks in my pocket. It was a start. So this was good debt. You see, I, this. The debt also went out and paid, but it also put $25 in my pocket. So net, net, I was making money from my little house. So today, my wife and I own 6,500 of them. And every month, 6,500 houses put money in my pocket. My, my people who live in them love me and all this because they have a place to live. But all of this comes from debt. Tip three. Find mentors. One of the most commonly talked about tips, but one of the most important ones out there. Having a mentor that can lead you through tough times, help you understand your field, and guide you to become the best you can be is an essential part of becoming successful. The, my Sunday school teacher was a young, pretty woman, you know, and she said, I'm like nine. And she goes, why were the three wise men wise? You know, I go, because they were rich. You know, they, gave, they, gave, they gave the swaddling Jesus Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So they have to be rich guys, I said. And they know commodities as well. Yeah, yeah good <laughs> idea. 
And she goes, no, no, that's not it. I said, well, well, they had gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Well, that's not it. I said, why were they wise? And I went, I don't know. She says, what made them wise was they always sought the best teacher. And she says, if you're going to be a successful in your life, you've got to find the best teachers. Wealthy people spend their money to earn more money. The majority of everyone else spend their money to buy things, which makes everybody else around them rich. My truth and my experience has been, I have to jump higher, I have to show up earlier, I have to be the first person to turn off the light and the last person to turn off the light. I have to make sure that every number is correct and every T is crossed and every die is dotted. The way that I show up is by being consistent, so consistent that people cannot doubt your capacity to succeed. You have to work harder than the average person and if you accept those terms, you cannot complain about those terms. I have only known success on the back of consistency. Do I think you could be a success without being consistent? Perhaps if you have other resources and tools that I was never given, but coming from where I am, my perspective has only been consistency and the discipline has been everything that I have ever gotten on the back of doing it again and again and again. It is what I teach, it is what I preach, is what I believe. You can't be afraid to be vulnerable because when you're vulnerable with somebody, about 95% of the time, They'll reciprocate in kind. And when both sides are vulnerable, that forms a connection. And that, that is a way uh, that I found all the time. Or also another one is, tell me your story. Everybody loves to tell their story. And uh, I'm just naturally a curious person, so I love hearing, so I, that never bores me. So it, it's really the power of one-on-one -on -one relationships. We're all given 24 hours in a day. So the difference between somebody who becomes sex successful versus somebody who does not is now what input you put in those 24 hours. If you're spending your time on Netflix, if you're spending your time playing video games, if you're spending all of your time doing things that don't add any value financially to your life, well, if you compare that to somebody who's now working, who's now learning, who's investing in the education, you're gonna see two completely different outputs. I had no business starting a business. And yet I started one and I have found ways to create and make and sustain multiple seven figure revenue streams. And while that may or may not be the case for everybody else, I strongly believe that every single business owner, once armed with what they know how to do, and once armed with the marketing, and once armed with the discipline, and once armed with the consistency, that they too can build a six figure revenue stream. I believe that with every fiber in my bones, can you deliver on the promise that you are making? Can you sustain those customer relationships? Because if then I believe hands down you can create a six-figure revenue stream and in America if you are creating a six-figure revenue stream you are in the one percent of the one percent and I think to myself as a person who received government issued food and substances I went to college on the back of government aid I was the recipient of people's benevolence and taxpayers money for me to go back and give back to a community I think to myself that my business has become a passport for me to move entire legacy industries, timelines, um, predisposed ideas of who I should be based on my gender, color of skin, or how I was raised. And I'm like, I became the thing that broke the system and the statistic, but I don't think I'm special. I believe everybody can do this. And so on the days that it becomes very hard, I think to myself, you have the passport. Are you going to keep it for yourself or you can help other people get out too? On the days that are the darkest, I always think to myself, can you help one person get a passport today? And that's the thing that continues to keep me pushing forward. You know, one of the things my dad always said is the key is when the world hands you a sack of sour lemons, the objective of the game is to turn into sweet lemonade. I'm going to give the advice that I heard my third year of business. I was sitting with a group of other photographers who were farther in their career, and I had always found a way, even though I couldn't afford to get educated specifically in the photography room because there was like very high ticket experiences, I would find a way to leverage what I thought I was good at in exchange. I'm a firm believer in bartering. Bartering is my favorite thing. And so I realized that um, while I'm not necessarily a copywriter, I wouldn't classify myself as like a writer. I had a blog. I had a blog at the time. I still have a blog. But at the time, I was blogging every single day. And other photographers started noticing the, the, the quality of work that I was doing. And so I found a photographer 
um, in my area. I was living in Los Angeles at the time. And I said, hey, would I be able to go to your event and write a few blog posts about your event? And in addition to, if you let me come, could I also write your bio, like for your website? Cause I gave like a little preview. I was like, his bio was just like, great photographer, love my camera. And I kind of wrote just like the first paragraph of what could be his bio based on things that I had read about him on the internet. And he was just like, yes. So I got into this room and what he said, I felt like it just pierced my heart. And this is the thing that I will tell everybody again and again. He said, jump and the net will appear. And it was the first time in my entire life that I had ever heard somebody speak so brazenly about taking a risk. Again, who I am now as a risk taker is so different than who I was when I began. And the way that you strengthen that risk muscle is by taking risks. I built a high performance team as we were getting going, right? And that's the most important job of any CEO. And I really believe that the organization, the company with the best people wins. Then the key is how do you get them working together as a team, right? You know, the way I believe in that is you've got to have a North Star, uh, a noble cause. Uh, you also need an enemy um, because, you know, that stops the water cooler talk. Nothing gets the blood stir. You know, in the United States State Department, we call it an adversary, but in business, we call it an enemy. And then the third thing you need is you need a plan. And with all these companies uh, that I had the good fortune to build and these different organizations, I ran, we would always have a playbook. And that's basically the vision, the mission, the values, the team rules, long-term goals, strategy, all boiled down to execution. So it really was a way to maintain alignment and a, 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 a tremendous tool when it comes to scaling. Number one skill set that generally uh, millionaires uh, master is persuasion. Persuasion to me is on many different fronts. One. They have to persuade their family that I'm going to go become an entrepreneur, please support me. They have to persuade their wife if they're married, their husband if they're married. They have to persuade their kids, parents, peers. They have to persuade investors. They have to persuade a, an employee to want to come work with them when they're small. They have to persuade a group of salespeople to want to come and sell their product. They have to persuade people on why their product is a special product. They have to persuade why their industry is a special industry and what type of an impact that's made in your life. You got to learn how to persuade people. You got to learn how to persuade when they're selling a customer, when your product may not yet be at the level you want it to be. You need to learn how to persuade investors on why they ought to invest into your company. You need to persuade executives and talents who are with established companies. Why ought to, why should they consider even working with something like you, working with an entrepreneur like you who is maybe not established yet. Maybe you're not there yet. You know, you got to learn how to persuade your competitors, persuade your partners, Persuade your vendors, persuade your carriers, persuade. There is a lot of persuasion that you got to do. By the way, you also, you got to learn to persuade yourself as well. You got to psych yourself out to get into the mode of wanting to get to work on a daily basis, especially those days that you know it's not an exciting day. You got to persuade yourself. Persuasion is one of their skill sets. You got to persuade when you learn how to negotiate. Negotiation is a form of persuasion. Learning how to sell. If you don't know how to sell, kiss entrepreneurship goodbye because selling is a form of persuasion. Negotiation is a form of persuasion. Speaking from stage is a form of persuasion. Not everybody speaks the same style, but you know, everything there is persuasion. Number two, let me tell you one thing that you know, most millionaires master is reading people. Reading people, and I'll, and I'll tell you what I mean by reading people, okay? The reason why reading people, millionaires end up generally becoming good at reading people is because they've been ripped off, backstabbed, lied to, cheated so many times that there are a lot of signals that they see a trend and saying, this person's like that, it reminds me of this person. You gotta learn how to read people. You gotta learn how to read a customer. You gotta learn how to read an employee. Sometimes I get surprised how some uh, people who are pretty successful, they're making 100, dollars $300,000 a year, how easily they fall for the trap of somebody who's full of it. Like, how do you not read that sometimes, right? You gotta learn how to read it, sharing the wealth. Hang tight, this is not a hokey, corny type of thing. I'll explain to you what I mean by sharing the wealth. The people that I've met who have created lots of wealth. I live in a nice community and, you know, I, I go to the guy across the street. He's a guy who was part of a, 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 a technology software company. He was one of the many guys that became very wealthy when this company was bought out. 
I go to the guy on the other side, lives in a six and a half million dollar house. They built, you know, five, 10, 15, 20 different dealerships. Berkshire Hathaway came and bought them. They won the biggest dealership here in town in Dallas and Texas. They bought him out. He was one of the many people who all experienced a lot of wealth and they made lots of money. I go and sit down with people who were part of startups and you hear stories of so many people. You look at Microsoft on why they kept growing. Apple, when they kept growing. When, when Steve Jobs died, most people don't know this, he only owned 0.6% of Apple stock. Think about it. The CEO, the founder, only ended up owning 0.6% of stock. Now, some people say, well, it's because he left, he went to next, and he sold another. Okay, I get it. Still, 0.6%. Microsoft, Bill Gates. So many people became wealthy with Microsoft. So many people became wealthy with Amazon. So many people become wealthy. Anything that's ever at the highest scale, wealth has to be created by multiple, multiple people. Leverage, it's very critical. Leverage, millionaires master leverage. And I think one of the reasons why they understand leverage is the sooner you learn that in order to do anything big, you need a team, is the sooner you'll start scaling at a very fast pace. You know, especially a lot of the driven, self-motivated guys that had high GPAs or did very good in school and they had good grades and they were always good at doing the homework right and nobody does it better than me, I'm not perfectionist, they typically have the hardest time. The guys that didn't have the best grades and they were kind of played a little bit of sports, they generally have, don't have a hard time with this. You know why? Because they've always needed help. So you got to learn how to delegate. What do you delegate? What do you not delegate? How do you manage and study a certain thing that you're delegating to somebody to see if they can full, fully come through with it? Crowdsourcing. At one of my favorite questions to ask our staff, or it doesn't matter who it is, I love to ask, what do you think? What do you think about this? What do you think about this idea? What do you think about that? What do you think about this? What, what, do you, what are your thoughts? And I like to ask every different type of uh, personality, somebody who is very skeptical, but very technical and smart, somebody who is action, excited, tell me what gets you excited about this, somebody who's normally in the middle and you don't get a lot of reaction. I want to see y'all because I want to know what they think about it. The best teachers are not in colleges. The best teacher are on YouTube. I got this iPhone. If you yeah. can't make money with that, hang it up. If you're looking in the mirror right now and you see a loser, that's what you are. I learned about money playing Monopoly. I learned more about life playing Monopoly than I did in college four years of college. You look at Cuomo and all those guys, they were, they were born rich kids from their father. Right. Now Trump could have taken that path too. He was he was born a rich kid. So it's not, I think it's, it, you're either an entrepreneur or you're not. So what happens to entrepreneurs who go out and they get their hand to them and they survive, if you survive, you see the world differently. And so that's what happened to you when you get injured and all this. Yeah. You see a different world, whereas some um, peacetime who's climbing the corporate ladder right now, they just lost their job. They're sucking their thumb. The rich dad, poor dad is the story of my rich dad who had no education, but he, he grew up in business for real. You know, he, he, he took over the family business at 13. So he kind of grew up in the real world of money where my rich dad was a PhD, poor, helpless, and desperate. Went to Stanford, North University, and there. <laughs> Northwestern, you know, very smart guy, good guy and all this. But as you know, the teachers don't know. Yeah. <laughs> the they teach stuff. They teach stuff they don't know nothing about. Right. Well, right. The, some of them are forced. To, I mean, they're forced to teach that, right? Some of them try to educate and, in other ways and inspire. Don't, don't defend them. Don't defend them. I don't like them. <laughs> anyway, you know what happens? When do I get in the most trouble? Is when I criticize going to school. Hmm because to many people, it's their only hope and salvation. Yeah. So if I say, well, I don't think school teaches you much, I may as well piss on the Pope. You know, they said, I know. Oh, religion. If, if you don't go to school, and then it tells them, well, you know, Steve Jobs dropped out. He did pretty good. Yeah. It's dropped out. Dell dropped Zuckerberg. out. Zuckerberg. Zuckerberg dropped out. Henry Ford, Walt Disney, they didn't, they, you know, they didn't hurt. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. If, if you're an entrepreneur right now, the world's open to you. If you're an employee, your world's dead to you. What if yeah. An entrepreneur can create their own success.
if I show you this diagram here, you know, this it's why I created my cash flow board game. Because mm -hmm. we have four different intelligences. We have mental intelligence. We have, I don't know what that one is, physical intelligence. You probably have very good physical to make, mm -hmm. you know, football and all that. Yeah. Emotional intelligence, but spiritual intelligence. So I went to military mm -hmm. school in New York. The first thing is spiritual. You know, I become a Marine. It's spiritual. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because you're putting your life on the freaking line. Yeah. You know, so Nazim Taleb, you know, wrote the book, The Black Swan. He also wrote uh, Anti-Fragile. He says there's three kinds of people in the world. There's fragile. And that's what our school systems are putting out. Fragile, MP, snowflakes. And that's your choice. You want to be that way? Have a good life. Mm -hmm. The second type is that so a fragile is like a champagne flute. Yep. You hit it, it shatters. Then the second one is called robust. And a robust person is like the rock. You know, you can pound on them, dump on them. Yeah. They take it. But that's all they do. They take mm. it. And that anti-fragile is somebody like you, where they pound the crap out of you. And you get smarter and better because of it. Mm -hmm. So I love Nazim Taleb. You know, a lot of people call him Dr. Doom. But... The way I look at this whole thing, this economy is, we're probably going into a depression. You know, we're not going to get out of this. Point. Really? Oh, yeah. And so the thing is, is this good for you or bad for you? I'm looking forward to it. You know, the last the last crash was 2008, and I made more money in 2008 than in my whole life. I'm now 700 million, almost a billion in debt. Really? You know why? Because I don't pay any taxes. The more debt I have, the less tax I pay. And the average guy goes, how do you do that? Because you have bad teachers. And so it's this whole thing that you got to choose your teachers wisely. Mm -hmm. That's why I wrote the book, Fake. Fake money, fake teachers, fake assets. I don't touch that garbage of what's out. I don't have a 401k. I don't have stocks, bonds, mutual funds, ETFs. Doesn't mean you shouldn't, but I don't need them. Okay? Right. right. And the other part is, look, for you young guys, the best teachers are not in colleges. The best teachers are, are on YouTube. The best teachers are on YouTube. Wake up. If you're holding that debt, you are holding something that will, money will come back. If the money's hard, if that's going to be good money that's coming back, it's going to be hard for those entities to pay back because it's a lot relative to their income and cash flows to pay it. And that means that the default risk rises. However, because it, you don't, it, you're holding that, it, it means that the debt will be bad one way or another. It's either bad because they don't pay it, it needs a haircut for them to pay it, or because they do pay it with money that is going to be printed to come back. So think of it this way, just want to make this clear. When there was the position that interest rates got a lot below the inflation rate, you're losing buying power. There's no good reason to own that. So if I look at inflation index bonds as an indicator um, or other indicators, I'm losing percentage points to inflation by holding that bond. Mm. And then when they, and, and people realize that, well, you don't want to do that. And then the other side of it was you want to bo borrow and buy stuff because you know, money's free. So companies borrow and buy stuff and individuals buy houses because interest only loans on the houses. I mean, like, okay, I can buy a house. I can buy an apartment. And so, but that creates the imbalance where it's terrible to be a lender um, and a creditor. And it's good to be a borrower and, and do that. So that imbalance takes place. It produces inflation. And then when it produces inflation and so on, then you say, I don't want to own these things anymore. 
and then it, and also um, the Federal Reserve says I better fight inflation they change things and so by raising interest rates to levels in which it goes from minus 1.7 percent in inflation index bonds to plus 1.7 percent and it makes it um, and it raises um, the short-term interest rates you know real interest rates much higher then lo and behold all the people who did all those things get hurt um, you as an individual should think about the total safety including maybe that terrible scenario doesn't happen okay that's what I'd like you to do that's what I'd like you to do and if you do that you will come to a better balanced better balanced position I want you to get balance I want you to have enough um, saving to have security to build the first level investing and in investing which is the same as savings it comes in tiers tier one tier two tier two three on risk and the first tier is if everything goes wrong I'm okay and everything could be inflation defl depression anything whatever it is I lose my job I, 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 I you know whatever it is I got that thing covered then your next level is okay what am I going to get the highest returns what is my best bet and then trip two that it's it's not just the investment it's where am I am I in the middle of a fight my god I don't want to be in the middle of a fight okay what's it going to be like so it, it does have geographic implications you know I don't know maybe it's the state or the the state you go to or the city you go to or the country you go to or whatever it is you know like um, and there are certain things you can do to say this one's going to be better than that one when I read about this show I thought of course this is perfect this is right up my alley a few days before I was supposed to fly out to L.A. and go on to the Shark Tank set in Hollywood, I got a call from Mark Burnett Productions, his assistant, who said, I'm sorry, we've changed our mind. We're not going to hire you, but we'll use you as a fallback. How insulting. A fallback. And so I sat right down and wrote an email. And in the email, I told Mark that I understood that he had asked another girl to dance instead of me but I was much more accustomed to coming in first. And I cited for him the worst things that happened in my life in very brief form. Donald Trump said I'd never get a penny of the $4 million commission I had to sue him for and won. Sister Stella Marie said I'd always be stupid and I'm not. The Old Boy Network in New York said I'd never succeed and compete with them until I became the number one rival. And I asked him if he'd invite both women out for the lone female seat and have us compete. And I went out there, his invitation, he turned around, and I won that seat, thank God. Imagine what my life would have been the last seven years if I didn't have these 38 wonderful entrepreneurs in my life helping them build their business. What a waste and what a shame. But I had learned by then the importance of getting right back up and come back fighting. And that's what got me that seat on Shark Tank. I don't think I'm the type of person that is brave enough to admit I've made a mistake, honestly, because I think things have not worked out along the way where things just didn't work out as I had hoped or dreamed them to be. And, but I don't see them as a mistake because as quick as you're thinking, oh, poor me, you start to see the light of the door that it's opening that couldn't have opened without it. Mm. Okay. So I don't have like a regret that this was a big mistake or that was a big mistake. But I have to also say I have my whole life been very cognizant of doing anything and exposing myself to anything, even when I didn't want to do it, because I'm deathly afraid of feeling like I would regret. Like, what if I don't do it? That's more of a motivation for me than doing. Like, for example, with Dancing with the Stars, I did not want to do it. I'm an old babe. The last thing I want to do is practice four hours a day. You were great. 
you, well, you think I was so great? Not the judges. They didn't think so. I was the number one person on Dancing with the Stars last season. Number one rejected. Now there's a record, okay. But so you might say that was a mistake with all the work that that led up to. And it was a social embarrassment. I thought I'd be rejected maybe number three or five or six, but number one, I never saw it coming. And so I was kind of a little mortified on that one. But you know what? I'm so thankful I did it. And the minute I recovered by the next morning, I'm like, thank God I did it. And thank God it's over. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Because I didn't want to, I said yes, because I didn't want to wonder what it would have been like. I learned that you get back up and all the opportunities and getting back up. Just got to be a habit of getting up. You get up and you're going to find something that you could do something with. Just get up. That's a habit. You have to make that happen.